एज सनातन धर्म और एज हिंदूज और एज सनातन we must continue to do our work with the purest of our intention as swami vivekananda did you know as so many other masters did mm. yeah and not come under the influence or attack or or the pressure of the forces commit yourself of doing something which is beyond i me and myself it is surely a formula to yield joyfulness and bliss in life older generation especially of india is full of stories mm. huh? and ours is a sabhyata of storytelling we are not capturing the stories if this generation goes will lose stories because i have lived and witnessed this process i fundamentally know that vivekanandas can be created the only purpose of this life is to attain the absolute ananda and blissfulness of life that's the only purpose we all come here with a seed with with this seed of awakening how long will you fight with the darkness huh? let's work on the light and the darkness will take you know the light will take care of the darkness yes. itself you know you don't need to fight with that Welcome everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Life Poster Show. Tonight we have a very special guest with us. He is Sri Anish Ji, whose interview appeared in the Life Poster magazine in the August issue of this year, and created waves all across. So we decided that this is the most opportune time to catch hold of him and listen to his wisdom. from his mouth directly shri anish ji is a visionary spiritual teacher mentor author and a public speaker after spending many years as a ceo and an entrepreneur in the corporate world a deep spiritual quest arose in him and he exited the corporate world to pursue this inner inquiry and move to the himalayas after over a decade of sadhana he was guided to speak and touch the lives of many fellow beings on the path to lasting love is endless he has now entered into a second phase of work which is the vision for the new humanity by raising the collective human consciousness ashri uh, anish is also a writer and poet his first book let the mud settle will be out in a couple of weeks thank you shri anish ji it gives us great honor and pleasure to welcome you tonight on our show we have many many eager listeners who have come simply to listen to you and i'm sure they will go back feeling hugely empowered hugely enlightened by all that you have to share with us so let me begin with my first question to you uh, tonight shri anish ji you talk about creating a new vision for humanity for raising the collective human consciousness now what is this new vision what do you mean when you <laughs> say uh, about creating a new vision can you please yeah. shed some light on yeah yeah first of all thank you shivi for for this platform thank you for such a warm welcome and i welcome all the participants all the listeners tonight uh, i'm joining from dharamshala dutch where we are based um, and there's a chill in the atmosphere already uh, weather is changing and i think uh, not just the weather is changing a lot of things on earth and on the cosmic level are also changing that is why uh, i came up with a vision for the new humanity uh, many friends ask is this a new vision for the humanity or vision for the new humanity i tend to call it vision for the new humanity why because i think uh, what we are looking for or what we are looking ahead in future is also completely changing the way we operate relate in this life with the world around us and within our own selves hence this vision kind of came up um to talk little more about that and i think shivi the format should be of course this is an interview so you you should ask questions but if time permits uh, we should leave some space for questioning by the participants also if the format allows that you know yeah, i leave it, up it to does, you it does it it allows yes. and that is the entire purpose of having excellent. this so that excellent. towards the end they can yeah. ask questions to you excellent that's excellent makes it yes. more engaging then yeah right. participatory excellent <clears throat> you know if we look at india shivi and mm. all the listeners you know every nation has a certain brand identity and india's brand identity from last let's say 10000 odd years has been wisdom you know our brand identity is not it or anything else our brand mm. identity has been wisdom but somehow we moved too away from our own brand identity 
and this vision this new vision for the new humanity the first part of the vision is to recreate that brand identity of india which is wisdom itself now you know if you look at human human beings or life as we see it human consciousness is at the root of it you know is at the root of everything our physical well being our emotional well being our mental well being our spiritual well being and our conscious well being so consciousness is at the, at the root of it so when you know when i entered into the deep sadhana for over a decade after moving from the corporate world uh, a phase came when i started traveling started speaking a lot and also starting meeting a lot of people to really see what is the current spiritual fabric of of different societies different nations in the world i traveled a lot maybe 16 17 countries in last 3 years and it felt that humanity is not heading in the right direction because most of our things are most of the ancient wisdom that we had has been corrupted systematically mm-hmm. and if if we do not create a vision for the new humanity then the whole pattern of the greed and the competition and you know uh, i me and myself will kill us and will kill the planet which is happening mm-hmm. hence i think the divine intervention happened and this new vision where we are not thinking about just our own self even from the sadhana perspective we are thinking of collective consciousness and we start to work towards that as individual and as collective beings and raise it systematically yeah mm-hmm. as as it was done thousands of years ago in our in our ancient bharat culture uh, so i think that's that's the broader um, vision and i think mm-hmm. it's just not me many beings have been working on this many beings before me have worked on it um mm. one such being was swami vivekananda who had a very similar vision mm. but i think it's been about a gap of over a century between him and me so mm. we are kind of tweaking the vision a little bit mm. or the the way the vision must manifest itself um so while i'm talking while i'm talking about the vision let me talk about a few parts of this vision mm. um so one part of the vision shivi is the leadership you know mm. i believe if the leadership of of any society is awakened you know mm. everything is a pyramid if the leadership of this pyramid is awakened the effects goes down to the bottom of the pyramid also mm. so systematically we are starting initiating some works where we are working with the leadership at mm. different layers of society so the corporate mm. leadership the educational institution leadership bureaucratic leadership uh, societal leadership and so on and so forth mm. and doing work to create more awakening in the leadership so that's that's one part of the vision the second part of the vision is also should we to recreate the learning culture of nalanda mm. Mm. you know in this part of the world uh, we are fortunate that thousands of years ago we build learning cultures here we build institutions for the spiritual well being and from there flew the entire physical men- mental and you know even financial well being of humanity mm-hmm. so to recreate similar learning cultures or learning mm-hmm. institutions mm-hmm. also to work on the education both mm-hmm. at the junior level and also mm-hmm. you know a uh, higher education level working mm-hmm. with the institutions so that mm-hmm. you know i'm an mba and what they we all know what they teach in the professional institutions is all about competition and greed mm. yeah mm. which we know is not sustainable mm. you know humanity cannot have a fixed 8 to 9% of annual you know financial growth economic growth gdp growth on mm. limited resources on earth mm. earth is like this much with limited resources how can you have unless endless uh you know growth. compounded economic growth with limited natural resources mm-hmm. so i think the model is flawed somewhere so in the uh, new vision we are we're talking about that also how how, how would you plan to go about it because i think mm-hmm. the biggest hurdle in this mm-hmm. direction is the media mm-hmm. itself which is mm-hmm. uh, crying day in and day yeah. out about the steady decline in the economic growth of this country and how the government yeah. should be held accountable for it correct uh, totally ignoring the fact that it cannot mm. be one sided and mm. you know unidirectional and the the hazards it is capable mm. of uh, mm. bringing in the human uh, condition as well as human society mm. 
Right. So when we are constantly being bombarded with this kind mm -hmm. of information that it is so integral and essential to human happiness, especially economic Correct. growth, Correct. how do you feel that you Correct. can send your message across <laughs> to this medium so that it stops and right. listens and does right. you know, brings down its cacophony around Correct. this concept? Shiv, if you look at life, hmm. everything is a narrative. Yeah. Right. Media creates a certain narrative. We all follow that narrative. Hmm. I'm saying there was another narrative few thousand years ago, which we were following as a society, as a culture. And that narrative was very scientific, which worked for us. And hmm. the narrative was the narrative of four Purusharthas, our ancient rishis and seers said, and this was very uh, research based, that there are largely four pursuits of human existence. Only four pursuits, actually, if you look at it. Mm. They said the first pursuit of human, human existence is dharma. Dharma is, uh, let's say, law of nature, understanding the law of nature. Yeah. Mm. And the law of nature is very simple. If you cut down all the forests, you won't have oxygen. That's law of nature huh? in a very simple way. So they said the first pursuit of human being is to be established in dharma. They said the second pursuit of human nature or human being is artha. Artha is the financial well-being, the, the material well-being. And they said the seers, the sages, the rishi said that's a pursuit, huh? nothing against it. Mm. So we said the second pursuit is artha. We said the third pursuit of human existence is kama. Kama is all kinds of sensory desires. Even that is allowed in, in, the, in the ancient Indian system, right? In the wisdom system. And then they said the fourth Purushartha, the fourth pursuit of human life is moksha, the final liberation, after you've gone through each one of this cycle. Mm. Yeah. Now see how the narrative has been changed. Today, the first and the last narrative, or first and the last pursuit, has been missing totally, has been mm. taken out of the narrative. Mm. Uh, so we're not talking about the law of nature, the dharma. We're ta not talking about the final pursuit, the moksha. We're only entangled in the second and the third pursuit, yeah, which is the artha and the kama, the financial riches or the material riches and the fulfillment of desires. Mm. Uh, the ad, it, it, you know, the ad industry, most of the industry that we see around is promoting that. Mm. I'm saying there's a way to, to bring back this old narrative, the narrative which worked. I think this is the narrative which made us so naked Yeah, mm -hmm. We build the entire society, entire system of earning and living based on these four Purushartha. Mm -hmm. I'm saying there's a way to bring that back. Mm -hmm. If we start to talk about it, if we start to create small models of this narrative, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you build a narrative? Basically, the more you talk about it, the more you live it as a living example, mm -hmm. the more you create small models of a certain narrative, it mm -hmm. starts to go out. Mm -hmm. People start to see it. People start mm -hmm. to imbibe it. People mm -hmm. start to get inspired by it. People start mm -hmm. to live that. Mm -hmm. It could be a long term process, could be a short term process. But I'm saying it's like if it's a collective process, it will work very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I said, Shivi, earlier, that we're working with the business leadership, we're working with the institutional leadership to bring this narrative back into our, our, our language, our life. Yeah, we're creating programs around it so that the similar narrative mm -hmm. comes back into our life, and we start to leave lead our life into a certain balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I, I hope that. That qualifies as answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, but I, I do. I still feel that uh, yeah. you know it's not easy. Not because easy because it's mm -hmm. not easy because we have been entrenched into living a certain uh, way and thinking in a certain way for like centuries, if not centuries, at least for the past seventy years, definitely. Correct. Because as soon as we got uh, freedom, correct. Uh, the main aim, the main pursuit of the society as a collective was to grow mm -hmm. economically and correct. get out of that state of uh, deprivation and uh, mm. destitution, which Correct. we have been afflicted with for a very long time, like for centuries. Mm. So for now, and, and 70 years is not uh, not a very big time. Mm. For, mm. It's, it's a very small mm. time frame. 
Hmm. Yet at the same time, it has become it, it's like become all pervasive. This particular hmm. thought that eventually the growth and hmm. happiness and prosperity hmm. will come only through economic means and through economic Correct. activity, Correct. which which is which which may not be all encompassing, but has hmm. to be sorted, selfish, hmm. and it works. It doesn't doesn't hmm. matter because we hmm. see corruption, which is like Correct. kind of infiltrating every Correct. every institution of the country, and people are totally remorseless about it. Hmm. So therefore, I do feel that it's quite a humongous task hmm. uh, because just to, to uh, just to interrupt you on that, Shivi. Hmm. Yes. Um, while what you're saying is one part of the story, hmm. but you see what happened during pandemic. Hmm. Yeah, uh, very painful process, especially in India in the in the second wave. What we witnessed, extremely hmm. painful. Hmm. Yeah, uh, griefful. Hmm. But see what has come out of it. People had huge amount. So let's talk about Delhi as an example. Mm. People had huge amount of money. Right. Yeah. But still many, I know a lot of people, my own, you know, close family people, mm. uh, rich businessmen, they mm. couldn't save their loved one. Yeah. Because they couldn't arrange for a, for a cylinder of oxygen in time. Uh, money could not save them. Shivi, since then, the amount of people I'm seeing turning to the real happiness or trying to find out the meaning of real happiness mm. has increased exponentially. It's like something has woken up suddenly in us. Yeah, mm. you're absolutely right that we are and we were running after, you know, the mm. money, the greed, the corruption and the rest of it. Mm. Yeah, but this event has, you know, shaken all of us. Yeah, huh? I agree. agree. Huh? There's always a blessing in disguise. Uh, in the pain comes the possibility. Mm -hmm. So in this huge collective pain has come a huge possibility. Mm -hmm. If you look around, suddenly the spiritual discourse, the discourse around what is the purpose of life, the discourse around what is real happiness, mm -hmm. it has gone up. I've seen in pubs people talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was recently in Delhi and uh, I had to meet a friend and that's an mm -hmm. interesting incident. So. Mm. Uh, and I was very hard pressed for time. I was mm. continuously traveling and this friend said, no, no, I have to meet you uh, for something very urgent. And I was mm. passing through, you know, south of Delhi, a place called Khan Market. Mm. I said, look, we could just meet in Khan Market in 15 mm. minutes. I'm just crossing. Mm. He said, done, you know, I'll be in Khan Market. So mm. now you, it was weekend. When you go to Khan Market on weekend, you don't get space. Yeah. The only place mm. we could get space was a pub there, uh, mm. a bar. Now you see me entering into a bar. <laughs> so I entered into the bar and we got one corner and thankfully they served um, uh, warm soup. So we were having soup and I was just listening to the conversation, you know, because bars are usually crowded. I was just listening to conversation in the bar. People were talking about young people, age group about, let's say, 24, 27. Yeah. These guys were talking about, you know, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Why are we running so fast for our jobs, our career? There's something missing. Of course, I did not interfere in the conversation. Mm. But for once, I was really glad mm. that the narrative is changing. Mm. This is coming in regular discussion. Mm. These are the signs of change, you know, the winds of change that I'm witnessing and all of us are witnessing. Right, right. The question is, can we ride on this? Mm. There's a wave. There's a mm. wave of massive transformation or transition. Question is, can we ride on it? Mm. Are we at least some of us who feel that there's a bit of awakening in us, you know, just mm. even a small bit of, mm. it brings a lot of responsibility on us. Mm. Can we ride this wave and can we make sure through our karma, extend this wave far and wide? Mm. Mm. Will it take centuries? Will it take 10 years? You mm. know, let's, uh, let's remember Krishna and the Gita. What is the karma that I choose to do? I'm not bothered about the result. I'm bothered about to keep a very clear intention and continue to work towards that. What comes out of it is, is his, his choice, not mine. Yeah. That's so that's how I'm kind of trying to operate from. Very great. Yeah. So uh, another thing that we, uh, we are coming across recently, which became very, very evident and apparent uh, during uh, 2020, mm -hmm. which was the cases of domestic abuse and domestic right. violence which mm. uh, came to the forefront like anything mm. why because 
uh, what the certain things could not be brushed under the carpet anymore mm. and they were like so many uh, so many videos mm. and pictures coming out of battered mm. women and battered children mm. uh, which is again a great cause for concern mm. so uh, anisha can you uh, tell us like why the sudden surge in the uh, in domestic abuse and violence mm. that we saw last year Hmm. And yeah. uh, hmm. what what can people do who are trapped hmm. in such toxic situations, partnered hmm. with people who are narcissistic and sociopathic, hmm. and hmm. literally who are damaging the others mentally and hmm. physically? So, hmm. what is the great lesson for people who are trapped in such situations, hmm. and what should they do hmm. to come out of it? Hmm. Uh, so, of course, this is a whole gamut of you know psychology behind it. Yeah. Hmm. So, I'm I'm not sure if I'm able to. if i'll be able to give you know do's and don'ts in this but let's look at this as a as a perspective right mm. and see if we can get something out of it mm. so during the during the lockdown period you know the cases surged mm. of of domestic abuse violence and so on and this was very evident of two key things here one thing that we all have a lot of energy even you know the physical energy if that energy is not channelized properly yeah earlier the energy was channelized people were going out they were in the you know in in their busy schedule running around somehow the energy was being spent now you're locked in a room you're eating food the energy is getting built up but there is no channel to express that energy positively you know uh, because somehow we've not built a culture where you know as a child i'm i'm trained i'm taught how to deal with my own energy yeah mm-hmm. if i have access or or something happening i could just go sing dance paint um uh, etc etc or or just jump we not been educated on the way to handle our own internal energy which is in the form of thoughts and emotions mm. right when the pandemic happened happened there was a lockdown people didn't know what to do with this access energy what do you do when there's a upsurge of energy in you you become violent you become aggressive right now if three people living in the house where would the aggression go not on the walls but on those people around right mm-hmm. so that's one phenomena mm-hmm. second phenomena again we've not created a understanding of relationship in people you know i, I see in people especially in relationship there is no concept of giving space to each other just no concept you know we are on each other's head all the time huh the the whole thought of that everybody living under the same roof we all need our own zones right in the pandemic that also happened people were on top of each other you know you were facing each other in a in a small uh, apartment all the time and there is no concept of you know allowing space that you can be in your room i can be in my room kind of a scenario mm. and there was a there were huge clashes again because we've not looked at relationship from those dimensions ever yeah so so this is i would say the reason largely we witness such cases now your second part of the question was you know how do you deal with it if if you are stuck in such a situation or a relationship how do you deal with that yeah. i would say after you've tested it out only then you know the water has gone up some things on life should be non negotiable non negotiable uh, uh this becomes one of those things and when in a relationship you know that it's there are things which are becoming non negotiable you need to learn you know that's another thing we've not taught uh, that how do you exit uh, in a with a with gratitude mm. you know i have not seen any relationship be it a personal or professional relationship which ends the exit ends with a very peaceful and a gratitude nal way because you know these are the things we've never focused we've never talked about it and we don't educate each other on these parameters mm. yeah imagine from the school onwards from the college onwards if we are taught that this, the mantra of life is whenever you exit you must exit with deep gratitude and peaceful loving uh, zone so do you believe exit, that yeah. uh, the, the the subject of relationships should also be an essential part of the curriculum because like we are taught everything on the earth which may or may not be relevant to us but most important things yeah. like relating to world relating yeah. to people relating to ourselves how how to form friendships how to live in a society mm. these things are just not taught anywhere 
I, I don't think they're taught yeah, anywhere yeah. in the world. So do, do we feel that uh, you know, this it is very important to have a new set of curriculum which has these important elements also uh, for, for, mm. the, for the easy facilitation of human life on earth? Mm. Do you feel it? Absolutely, absolutely. I would say, Shivi, the start of this is, mm. you know, I as a child need to be trained or taught or inspired to have a have a deeper relationship with my own self mm. right if somehow we can build that as part of the system yeah a systematic process mm. see if you know how to deal with your own self then you know how to deal with the others mm. our problem is we don't know how to deal with our own selves mm. as, as i said the case you know if there's an upsurge of certain emotional energy in you or, or mental energy in you mm. we don't know how to deal with it yeah Forget about others for a moment, you know, mm -hmm. this is the world for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, you know, in the in the vision for new humanity, Shivi, that's also one of the agenda. Why should not we talk and, and, and teach our kids? How do you have a better relationship with your own self? How do you accept your own self? You know, mm -hmm. we work with the youth here. Mm -hmm. You know, the fundamental problem of the youth, they don't accept themselves. Huh? you know so on so forth come on dude what's the what's what's the problem why why don't you accept yourself the way you are you know if the nature has accepted you by sending you here by feeding you here why aren't you accepting yourself completely right mm -hmm. so i think these are the fundamental things we are absolutely missing in our the way the education has been laid out and mm -hmm. you know i'll also go to a length to say that you know the current education system that we have is not our education system mm -hmm. this system does not represent our own civilization it's a borrowed system it is time to revisit that you know with with all dignity you know whatever good has come to us from invasions mm -hmm. let's keep that but mm -hmm. let's look at our own sabhyata and and bring sutras from there and create a new model i mean if you come to think of it it shouldn't be difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, every other day i meet with ones of this country shivi they are full of wisdom if you bring these 20 with ones in a room and you try to create a curriculum it shouldn't take more than 30 days mm -hmm. it is not rocket science mm -hmm. yeah but somehow i i think we are failing our youth we're failing our our children but by not by not having the enough courage to a talk about it or to work towards this, because uh, do, maybe we are too caught up with our own. Uh, do you think kapana. that the problem lies in not in this kind of knowledge system not being institutionalized, uh, like uh, by the government itself? Because you know, either you can teach it individually, or different different spiritual teachers and masters can teach it differently. But it's it does not guarantee that this kind of knowledge will reach everybody. So hmm. first. To some extent, there is a need for the institutionalization of this new curriculum so that everybody gets access to it and nobody gets left behind. Hmm. Absolutely, I, absolutely. But Shivi, when we talk about institutionalization, we always look up to the government. I'm hmm. saying, fine, that's one big sector there. Hmm. But you see, if you look at India, let's talk about education, you know, I would say still a large part of education in India is held by private players. Mm. Not with the government. Of course, government has a certain reach, mm. right? Mm. But with reach, there is a dilution also, mm. right? But look at some of the private institutions. So I'm saying, yeah, I think we need to change this mindset. Let's not look only up to one central authority called the central government or state mm. government. Mm. We all can create our own small institutions. Why not? Why, why that cannot happen? You know, why we can't create small models of, you know, 100, 200 students, people, mm -hmm. and, you know, work towards that. And uh, that's how forest fires happen, Shivi. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's, true. that's how forest right. fires. I live in the yeah. Himalaya, so I see forest fires. And then I, you know, I walk a lot here. Mm -hmm. And I enter into the jungles and I see one small thing causes forest fire. You can't even comprehend that. Yeah. Uh, Anisha, yeah, this brings me to another question that then, you know, you talking about working with people and working for people and yet you choose to live, right. live in Dharamshala, which is like such a remote area as compared to mm. where the masses live in India. Mm. So does it mm. come in the way of you executing your vision? Because, it, I mean, there's a less chance of you being at, able to actually meet and influence the people who need to be influenced by you. 
do you yeah. ever feel that this is can be a handicap yeah. you are not really into the thick of things currently yeah. at least physically so the scenario pre covid was i was traveling left right and center hmm. uh, then the covid happened suddenly the online channels opened up so the need to execute your work without traveling mm. was out you know you could just execute from anywhere mm. however when the when the travel is again opening up i i, I said that i was just in delhi about mm. a week ago right mm. so earlier i used to feel pre covid that you know uh, maybe we need to have multiple bases or maybe you know as you're saying you know you, mm. from dharamshala to work in the cities but i think the channels are opening up now Mm-hmm. and also the part of the vision also shivi is uh, we will create multiple mees mm-hmm. yeah i keep saying that you know we need about 100 more vivekanandas back in india uh, mm-hmm. to uplift this whole system once again and that is not unachievable mm-hmm. yeah okay. you put your heart and soul and your life and your blood into it it will happen that way yeah okay. uh what role do you see uh, of women playing in the creating of in the creation of this new uh, say new vision for humanity because what i see is that women have not yet reached that complete potential they're still so far behind in terms of equal participation in all walks of life mm. uh, and i feel that so many and those who do have access to these channels of self expression are in so many ways sabotaging themselves and not really uh able to come out of their say you no know, the of fixation with the body like mm. you know the self identification is with the body and not with their mind and soul as much as it should be right uh, so do you you know do you see any hope in this regard and what can women do for themselves to mm. really be there in the mainstream and be the harbinger of uh, universal change mm. which is which has space and opportunity for everybody correct correct so first of all shivi women would play a huge role in this process yeah. from the start itself you know if you look at life you know we are in the womb for 9 months that's our first training ground actually that's our first school mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of research which is now proving mm-hmm. that a lot of your conditioning and formation of your you know thinking patterns also happen in the womb huh? so that's the first school we enter into first learning laboratory so to say Right now, that's where the foundation of a human being is laid. So, women have a very, very huge role from the time of you know, let's say, pregnancy, yeah. Which then means, so, so A is about the importance of you know, shakti, the women in this whole whole scheme of things. You know, I always say, women is a manifestation of shakti and the mother at the same time. Mm-hmm. women need to realize that more than you know other sexes it is very unfortunate that most of the women do not realize their own uh, i would say power. their own power their own potentiality their own possibility it's like you're suppressed because you somehow feel you are weak and then look at a okay let's look at a body you know when a body has low immunity virus attacks right it's a simple process when you think you are low you are attacked when you think you are weak you are attacked or or you you are trying you know somebody tries to control you etc etc yeah so the root of it somebody feeling that somebody is weak or not equal yeah again it's a narrative again the more we talk about it this narrative will start to change huh? hence there's a you know i can tell you stories and facts about facts shivi where just by talking about a certain things it starts to manifest it starts to become a reality yeah so mm-hmm. women in in our setup especially you know i can give you our example in our setup we call this setup as sadho hmm? so. that's a word from kabir ji you know so no bhai sadho sadho means o seeker hmm? so we calling all the seekers out so in our setup in sadho women have a very central role here because i'm seeing them as shakti i'm seeing them as mother and and, and we are constantly you know training them guiding them or nurturing them in in a way that you know they start to feel it mm. the day they will start to feel it recognize their own potentiality you know they will start to fly you can't even you know 
then tame them, so to say. <laughs> yeah. So very significant okay. role. The fundamentally, what I'm trying to say, an extremely significant way, uh, role. And I think as a nation also, women need to come on the top, at okay. at the at the in the government position, in bureaucracy, in corporate positions, in educational institutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that trend happening now. Yeah. We are a very diverse and complex society or mm -hmm. diverse, complex nation, but I'm seeing this change happening. Recently, Anishi, there was a conference in the West on dismantling global Hindutva. Okay. Oh. Now, mm -hmm. this was a very surprising for all Hindus uh, across the world because, okay. uh, because Hindus are generally one of the most accommodating and most non-interfering kind of community Correct. anywhere. Mm -hmm. So for a huge international conference being organized to dismantle Hinduism or Hindutva mm. was, was something which we didn't make sense at all to people mm. because we are not a threat to anybody anywhere. Mm. Correct. Okay. Mm. So what do you think was the mm. reason behind the organization of such a conference and what mm. should Hindus or Sanatanis mm. uh, no, take home from it? Like mm. uh, what, what could be the lesson embedded in, in this entire activity, mm. which was uh, very shocking for most mm. people? I think I not only Hindus but even non-Hindus. I see. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> Shivi, I don't know personally the peop who who were the people or you know organizations yeah. or institutions behind such conference. I hmm. I have no insight into that. Hmm. But I, if I if I again try to look at it from let's say thirty thousand feet view, hmm. you see as you're saying, you know, Sanatan Dharma has been the has been a process of of peace of you know accepting all thought forms mm -hmm. yeah accommodating every style of let's say worshiping etc etc mm -hmm. and this is like this goes back you know i think ours is the 10000 year plus old civilization only surviving civilization and sanatan dharma if you look at the history was probably uh, over 5000 year old setup mm -hmm. right but compare this with last 1000 years i think because we were too open, too accommodating, too welcoming, too, uh, you know, peaceful, happy people, so to say. I, and I'm trying to, you know, just relate with that. Last thousand years, if you see, you know, invasions after invasions, attacks after attacks. Now our peacefulness or our accommodatingness was our strength, yeah, which got perceived as our weakness, yeah. And because of that, you know, enormous amount of invasions and, you know, British rule, it ended with British rule, and we kind of lost a lot to that. Now, so two scenarios, huh? your accommodating nature, and then thousand years of invasions. Somewhere after independence, probably we started realizing about this. Yeah, may, may not be after independence, maybe recently, last five, 10 years, we started realizing this. The moment we started realizing this, we said, let's reunite. Yeah, let's reunite because let's bring our tradition, our, our ancient civilization's wisdom back. Now, the problem today is whenever you try to regroup yourself, mm -hmm. you are perceived as a threat by somebody. People think that if you are regaining or reuniting yourself, you must be reuniting yourself to be against somebody. You follow? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it, this is how the human mind works. Whenever 10 people try to reorganize themselves in a locality, others feel threatened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I think the world needs to realize that the history or the tradition of Sanatan Dharma is not that. Mm -hmm. We are reuniting again so that we're not taken up for a ride ever again. We've lost too much because we have been taken up for a ride. Right? We don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So we are reuniting to preserve ourselves, to nourish this culture, yeah, mm -hmm. to create a better version of life with this with this ancient wisdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the purpose why we are reuniting ourselves. But as right. I said, you know, mm -hmm. there are forces who will feel threatened. Mm -hmm. While there is I I don't think Sanatan will ever threaten anybody. But today, that's how the world has become. You are, you know, if you talk about Hindu dharam, you are straight away plugged into, you know, this group or that group, this wing mm -hmm. or that wing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, I think these are phobias somehow, uh, 
uh, I would say the this is the nature of this yuga, the current yuga shivi, uh, where even if you try to do good, uh, people will uh, you know judge you or or they won't believe look at, you. Look at you, you with suspicion. You 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 looked at suspicion. Mm. So that's the yuga. Unfortunately, you know we are in. Uh, and then there'll be people, there'll be forces, there'll be institutions, you know, who will never trust the the true bhav from which you are operating from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these must be those people or those institutions. Yeah. Because they would see everything from their own lens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we must always be very, very clear as Sanatanis, as Hindus, as, you know, as, as sons and daughters of this land, we must always be clear that why we are doing this. Are we doing it because we want to be against a certain nation, certain culture? Or we are doing this so that we become culturally strong, we become culturally wise, we become economically, you know, better off. Yeah. And we become more integrated within our own self, you know, as a collective humanity, huh? not one against the other. I think that's the that's the intention which we must always be very, very authentic or clear about. Yeah. This this actually also surprises me because there have been n number of gurus and masters and mm. spiritual leaders and visionaries mm. who have gone to the West, who have propagated the message of Sanatan Dharma mm. of oneness and universal brotherhood and Vasudev Kutumbakam and whatnot. Mm to you know as many people as possible so that mm -hmm. you know they actually get to understand the very mm -hmm. basis or the foundation of sanatan's vision mm -hmm. and how you know the more you adapt to it the more uh, you know uh, more beneficial it would it would be for the humanity as a whole mm -hmm. and sanatan dharma has made uh, very distinct inroads into the west which is very evident because most of the masters including vivekananda or paramahans yogananda or swami sachidananda and even today mm. including yourself mm. you, you keep visiting and you keep addressing people and yet uh, to to see this kind of a fear in the western mind is really uh, not difficult to understand that even after understanding, even after even benefiting from it, because yoga is now being celebrated mm. worldwide, people should should still feign ignorance of the essence of Sanatan Dharma and treat it as a threat. Mm. Now, these two things kind of don't really add up or make sense. So then mm. what do you have to say about this? Mm. That on the one hand, we mm. are addressing and we are mm. taking the message across. And on the one hand, you know, we, we see this kind of resistance mm. from the same people. I learn a lot from nature, Shivi. Mm -hmm. Where I live, there are a lot of forests and you know mm -hmm. farms all around. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way life works, you know, whenever you sow something, so I see farmers, let's say, sowing a certain crop. When they sow that crop, mm -hmm. no matter what they do, there'll be a lot of weed which just comes automatically. Right? Now, everybody would have a different way to deal with the weed. Mm -hmm. Some would just spray on the weed, some would just let the weed be there. So there are different ways to deal with the weed. I'm saying as Sanatan Dharma or as Hindus or as Sanatanis, we must continue to do our work with the purest of our intention as Swami Vivekananda did, you know, as so many other masters did. Mm. Yeah. And not come under the influence or attack or, or the pressure of the forces. See, if you start to fight with the dark, you lose a lot of energy. Yeah. Mm. You just, mm. you just can't do that. Mm. So the only way to do is you keep working on your light and your own conviction and to spread that light. I think that's the only way forward. That's true, that's true. Yeah, because limited resources and energies, how long will you fight with the darkness? Mm -hmm. huh? Let's work on the light and the darkness will take, you know, the light will take care of the darkness, darkness. itself. You know, you don't need to fight with that, okay. you know. So that's how I personally view this. You know, I don't know if the world operates like this or no, you know. Mm -hmm. Talking about economics, which you had referred to earlier uh, yeah. during the conversation, uh, what do you think should be the correct uh, model of doing economic activity, which mm. is uh, you know, not a threat to anybody, including right. Mother Earth, as well right. as it brings the kind of abundance people want, right. because people don't want to compromise on this aspect. Right. So therefore, I right. feel it is very difficult to bring them back to the idea of a holistic business activity, mm -hmm. because I feel that it can be more time taking than the current economic activity, which gives quicker result because it's right. based on exploitation. Right. And if something is not based on exploitation, the results come later, though, even though mm -hmm. they may be, you know, more, uh, more beneficial or say, 
more long lasting than the those short term gains can get you Correct. how do you think you know you can you know what should be the correct way of indulging in economic activity yeah few things on this shivya i would say one is as i said earlier you know the four purushartha principle dharma arth kama mokta i think if we can bring this in a contextual way in a contemporary way to people's life that your pursuit for for finance for material resources should be based in dharma that's the only thing we are saying right yeah. if your pursuit of earning money so there is no bar on earning money please earn your as much wealth as you want mm-hmm. make sure your pursuit of earning wealth is rooted in dharma if we can if we can start to teach or train the world about this yeah mm-hmm. so that's one thing mm-hmm. the other thing in corporate india shivi i see a lot of positive change happening you know almost every big company now has a csr division almost every big company now you know funding some forest uh, or or funding some activity to clean up the river etc mm. their brand value is now getting associated with their uh, green footprint values as consumers also consumers have started questioning that mm. are you a company which is spoiling the forest next door if you are that then i'm not consuming your product right this consciousness is awakening in both the corporate world and the consumers right we need to fuel this more and more third there's a whole wave of minimalism coming in the world which is a very good wave huh? mm-hmm. people are understanding and as i was mentioning earlier even during pandemic you know people understood they can't save somebody's life some a loved one life no matter how much money they have let's redefine the 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 definition of luxury and comfort itself you know people thought living in a multi story house in the middle of a city is luxury but we have been seeing and we've been proven that you can't even breathe there properly is that luxury yeah as i'm saying people have started questioning these things that what is luxury is not drinking fresh water mm. breathing absolute pristine air eating fresh food is that not luxury and i think i'm meeting more and more people who whose definition of luxury and comfort have started to change shivi if this trend we are as i said if this trend this this wave if we can you know exponential exponentially put a lot of focus energy narration in this wave you know you will see that economic activity will start to balance themselves yeah i'll give you another example that there are a lot of businesses who are just not about greed you know in 1870 when jamshed ji tata started the whole tata empire the first of its kind you will be surprised that they were the first one to introduce schemes like employee provident fund esi mm-hmm. uh, you know employee medical welfare etc mm-hmm. when it was not part of even the government system a corporation brought that the fixed working hours for you know their employees mm-hmm. they brought all of these welfare schemes huh? they brought the parameters that we will not encroach on nature yeah mm-hmm. we will only take so much of nature and then we will uh, refill the nature so to say mm-hmm. 100 years ago they started doing that mm-hmm. of course in between lot of greed took over um, in the business not their business but in all businesses mm-hmm. yeah but i'm seeing this trend is reversing itself uh, and again where is the root of all of this the root of all of this are we conscious the moment you and i become conscious you know spiritually little awakened all of these things will start to take care of themselves yeah to me that is the root of everything you know as we say in hinduism atma is the root of everything uh, i'm rephrasing it i'm saying mm-hmm. your conscious awakening is the root to everything if that is fixed if that is fixed your emotional well being will be fixed if that is fixed your mental well being will be fixed if that is be fixed your physical well being will be fixed that is how the the entire thing flows not the other way around right. yeah we just need to reverse this trend from the physical now the physical has come on the forefront mm. i'm saying this adhyatma the spiritual the the conscious awakening must come on the forefront and then we must lead life uh in the fullness of it with the absolute abundance of it 
That's true. Yeah. So I'll ask you one more, uh, one last question, and after that, I'll uh, you know ask the listeners to please type their questions uh, in sure. the chat box. For our, we'll sure. I'll take ask those questions, and Anishi will answer. So uh, Anishi, can India really become the wish for Guru once again? Because mm. it's currently it is uh, struggling to uh, stay ad uh, stay adrift in the plethora of. Mm. economic and political and social turmoil which is gripping mm. the country so mm. is it possible do you see that this vision can be realized sooner yeah <laughs> uh, uh, a feedback there shivi uh, a feedback there because i've heard this this question this term from very many people that will india or can india become a vishwa guru etc mm. i'm saying why we are fixed with this thought why do we want india to become vishwa guru yeah I'm saying, can we not just work towards it and, and see what happens out of it? Again, I'm bringing uh, Krishna back into the picture. Why can't we just focus on the the karma that I, the karma that is ought to be done? And if the karma takes us collectively to a situation when India becomes a Vishwa Guru, very beautiful. Because if this becomes our thought process that India must become a Vishwa Guru, then we are entering into a certain, it's like then we are creating two groups. One group which want in, wants India to become a Vishwa Guru, the other group which does not want India to become a Vishwa Guru. And we will end up fighting among ourselves. And again, a lot of dissipation of energy will start to happen. Yeah. I'm saying let's not even build that as a popular narrative. Let's do the right thing. That is it. If we continue to do the right thing, if this has to happen, it will happen. If this has to happen in our lifetime, it will happen. If this has to happen, you know, 10 generations down the line, it will happen. If this does not have to happen, it will not happen. But let's be very okay. clear. I'm here for a certain job. Let me do that work. I've been given sir, a certain role. Let me perform that role to the best of my ability and not get fixed into any certain notion. Yeah. So this is again my personal view on this that's a, that's a great way to think yeah. about this and one story. one one more thing you know you use the word in between i think turmoil that we're mm -hmm. going through a turmoil i just want to put one thought on that is shivi what we see as a turmoil is actually not a turmoil it's a, mm -hmm. it's actually a transition yeah mm -hmm. why i am picking this particular word and you know talking about it because if we start to see surroundings or things all around political, geopolitical, social, financial as turmoil, we will start to believe it. We will start to believe that it's all of all of this is a turmoil. If we start to see it as a turmoil, mm -hmm. our confidence level to do our karma, mm -hmm. our, our exuberance to do our karma, all will start to go down mm -hmm. because it is actually not a turmoil. We are going through a transition. I said in the beginning that the weather is transitioning in the Himalayas here. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's chill in the air. I'm saying similarly, human consciousness is going through a massive transition, massive transformation. Of course, when that level or that amount of transition happens, one tends to feel little uncertainty, pain, or you know, some mm -hmm. confusion here and there. But let's not label it as a turmoil. Let's be very conscious of the word that we use that this is a transition we are going through yeah, collectively thank you i think that was thank very you. really a, a great way to think about the current situation and and that's the, the not only that i think that's the right way to think that's like they're taking the huge bird's eye view of the life before us currently what right. we are going through so that we can put things into the right perspective and work in accordance to what is our dharma currently so thank Glenn you. has asked the first question. Sri Anirji, I enjoyed your talk very much and I thank you. You said we need more Vivekanandas. How can such Vivekanandas be created? Wow. Well, I was hoping that somebody must, must, must nudge on this particular thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, how can Vivekanandas be created? You know, Glenn, the story goes when Naren came to uh, Ramakrishna Paramhansa, he was Naren, you know, very stubborn, mm. uh, full of energy, full of resolve, mm. uh, not going down, huh? like an erect, strong man. And then he comes to the presence of um, Ramakrishna. In that presence, Glenn, the Naren gets transformed into a Vivekananda in that presence. Yeah. 
because this being pours all his energy all his love on on narain uh, and narain transforms there's a deep alchemy we are talking about here there's an alchemy through which a narain gets transformed into a vivekananda i have seen that um, that magic happen many times i have seen the process how this magic happens i might not be able to put it into words i might not be able to prove this to you or or to anybody but i have witnessed this process yeah because i have lived and witnessed this process i fundamentally know that vivekanandas can be created yeah i i don't know if if this gives you the satisfactory answer yeah uh, there's a bit of mystery around it <laughs> yeah but uh, yes hundreds vivekanandas can be created this is how life is okay. and i think we have entered into the right yuga right time of transformation or transition where this alchemy will start to work more and more yeah okay. um, yes so that's, we yeah. we have a, another question from kajal she asks what should be the decision making uh, criteria uh, to pursue a corporate life and find purpose there or or, or alternatively pursue the spiritual path to progress what mm. should be the criteria so kajal i would say the first criteria is if there is anything that you are doing just for yourself i me and myself yeah it will not yield happiness it might yield immediate pleasure short lived pleasure but it will not yield joyfulness yeah mm -hmm. if you commit yourself of doing something which is beyond i me and myself it is surely a formula to yield joyfulness and bliss in life mark this as a mantra now mark this as a mantra now evaluate every decision of yours in life based on this mantra yeah big and i'll i'll do a precursor of this you know people ask me what is the purpose of life the only purpose of this life is to attain the absolute ananda and blissfulness of life that's the only purpose you know what buddha got after so much of tapasya nothing it was absolute sheer joyfulness and ananda that's the ultimate purpose of life right so use this formula to evaluate if you are entering into the business world in the corporate world evaluate if the nature of work is only for i me and myself or if the nature of work is such that it does add some value to to all the stakeholders or the people around or the nature around or the communities around if your work is adding value to the society around to nature around to communities around to larger humanity around to all forms of life around it's worth investing your life energies into if it is not it will bring little bit of pleasure here and there but uh, you'll keep struggling for the joyfulness of of or the exuberance of life yeah that's so, a great great yeah, answer that... okay so we have another question from vijayan nambudri pal Guruji, while enlightening us about the change humanity, or rather a revisited humanity, you mentioned about about the youth in the bar, the women, uh, etc. Why we should not think about the section of society who are at the threshold of old age to propagate this idea? For it, they can be the one. For they they will be the one who can imbibe the concept easily. Like he's talking about why hmm. only youth right. and women. Why not yeah. uh, the senior citizens? Hmm. See well. this entire process is very inclusive my friend you know so we are not excluding any section or any age group out of it huh? my my view is till the time the breath is on mm. there is a possibility it has nothing to do with age till the time the breath is on no matter what your age is there is a possibility of transformation in your heart right now talking about the 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 old old people one of the things that i think uh, i've been talking to a lot of people uh, because i don't have time to do that but i'm talking to a lot of people to try to instill that thought or idea that older generation especially of india is full of stories mm -hmm. huh? and our is a sabhyata of storytelling mm -hmm. we're not capturing the stories if this generation goes we'll lose stories yeah i'm saying let's create some channels where we bring the older generation as volunteers to let's say kindergarten schools to mingle with the young child children there and to narrate the stories to them so both way they get benefited the old people get a lot of exuberance and freshness of life because they tend to get little 
you know dull because it's the last leg of their life and the young children gets to learn the life transformative stories from their wisdom we need to if we can bridge somehow these two segments it will be great yeah uh, but fundamentally we're not excluding any any age group i will actually go on and say we're not excluding any life form mm. forget about old age yeah spiritual process or or the transitioning process is such that all life forms will get affected if you start to do pravachan in a true manner you know even the plants around you start to you know grow better yeah so all life forms get impacted yeah okay so aisha has a question to follow up from the first question if vivekananda is created shouldn't the seed already be ready in that person waiting to sprout something should be ripe or within for the person to be transformed isn't that's a question like unless and until the seed is there Hmm. no seed can uh, sprout into a vivekananda correct that, uh, correct see that so how do you think correct. that we can make it possible for, for yeah. so many vivekanandas if the seed yes. itself is not there correct i am saying or i am asking rather is there any human being in life who does not have the seed yeah no we all come here with a seed with with this seed of awakening with the seed to transform into a vivekananda every human being comes with that seed do we allow that seed to flower or not is usually our choice yeah but i will not say only our choice it also depends on the surrounding on the environment mm -hmm. huh? it depends on a lot of things it's a, it's a bit of a complex process however it 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 has a huge component of you pouring your attentiveness your energy into making sure that the seed sprouts mm -hmm. yeah so that's the element i'm talking about so i'm so i'm saying two things here i'm saying Number one, there's not even a single human being who does not come here with the seed. First point. Second point, I'm saying, if you do not put your conscious energy to nurture your own seed, don't expect the miracles. Then, yeah, do not be dependent on the external forces alone. They have a certain role, but more than that, you have a major role. Yeah, it's a combination of yin and yang, so to say. Huh? Hope that okay. qualifies again as an answer. <laughs> okay so they're like uh, thank you guruji thank you very much says vijayan uh, uh, yes, are there yeah. any more questions anybody else who's there is, wishes there is there is a question which was asked by mukesh uh, saraswat if consuming milk of animal by us is against nature there are multiple theories i think mukesh huh? there are multiple theories around this you know from science domain and from you know spiritual domain um if you look at it i think consumption of milk of a certain species by another species is, is somehow does not fit into the right understanding you know mm -hmm. one species um milk is is given by nature for its own offspring right Te technically speaking however we explored in the past and we said okay no no the component of this milk is such that even human species can also consume it without much damage now science is saying you know there are two sections of scientists i i recently came across a book which i think the title of the book was milk is poison or something like that <laughs> yeah or poison in milk the silent killer no no the yeah the title of the book was the silent killer now that that so so i'm saying it has not so there is no adhyatmic element to it first of all you know let's not put into the spiritual element of it okay let's simplify it for the sake of this discussion let's own i know two types of people one section of people who consume milk and they feel deeply bloated ha huh? really bloated and they can't function properly ha huh? there is another section of people when they drink milk they feel energetic i am saying listen to your bodies uh, let's not bring any spiritual angle or religious angle into it ha huh? listen to your own bodies and you will get the answer if this compound this milk is working good for your body please go ahead uh, don't bring any don't bring any mental concept into it if it is not adjusting well with your body listen deeply to your body uh, it will give you the right answers uh, for your for your own betterment yeah mm -hmm. but there is a, an ethical question definitely attached to the consumption mm -hmm. of milk because mm -hmm. uh, no it involves a lot of uh, you know harsh treatment on cows they are Correct. like 
they are kept pregnant throughout the year Correct. they are forced into uh, milking you know, into into giving milk for human beings Correct. Uh, working more than their uh, capacity and then kind of a lot of exploitation goes into it Correct. eventually they are even sent to the slaughterhouse once mm. they are not milked anymore mm. Mm. so perhaps this is more of an ethical question that if Correct. we kind of stop the consumption then so much of atrocity would not happen on an animal which cannot defend itself its, its mm. calf is being snatched away from her the calf is not getting the milk so then uh, you know does does it mean that kind of ethically we, we should avoid milk if not for Correct. health reasons absolutely so she we you know if we bring that element into it mm. then it is just not limited to to milk anymore mm. then this ethical understanding about a product that you consume then you must investigate every product that way you know you must investigate the way your shampoo is made and the effect of that shampoo on on nature you must investigate the shoes that you wear and the rubber mm. that you use and its impact so mm. on and so forth Hmm. I again let's go back to the original thought as I said and I'll tell you why I left that question open ended hmm. you know because I've been saying one thing again and again if we be, if we take conscious awakening as the root of everything hmm. Shiv you will start to get the answers of this without getting into the ethical non ethical moral non moral or you know religious or religious view kind of a thing hmm. yeah now if let's say I tell you that consuming milk is bad because of animal atrocities mm. right all right this person will stop drinking milk but this person will you know still be very unmindful of the way he or she let's say uh, destroys trees around mm. yeah now what do you do now you will go and teach him that look tree cutting is bad then this person will go and take all the dump into the river mm. do, do you do you follow what i'm trying to say i'm saying it is high time that we start to talk about and work towards fixing the root, not the branches anymore. These are all the branches. While it's good to talk about animal atrocities or, you know, uh, the, the issues with environment and so on and so forth, it's good to bring that sensitivity up. Mm -hmm. But in my last 15 years, I've seen if you only work on that sensitivity, mm -hmm. these are like branches of a tree. You mm -hmm. can't fix the branches. More branches come. Uh, more branches to travel your unawareness comes mm. it is time we start to work on the route and this is the yuga for that and we don't have luxury of time right mm. earth is crying mm. lot of other species are crying mm. we must work on the route so that once and for all these things starts to get fixed up yeah yeah i, I don't know if that makes sense to you but this is how yes, i it kind does, of yeah. it does it does it does Thank you so much, Thank you. Anishri. Thank you Thank so you, much. Shibi. It was a great honor to have you. It Thank was you. a personal pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.